Well, this evening we're going to look at the next, uh, the next section of Luke chapter 1. This morning, looking, of course, at the, um, oh, what is it, the introductory, the introductory matters, uh, and then uh, the appearance of the angel to Zacharias in the temple. Now we want to um, uh, look at the angel uh, coming to Mary and announcing the uh, coming of the Messiah uh, into the world. So let me uh, read for you Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at the statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Well, may again the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. Now, I've already mentioned this morning we were looking at some of the introductory matters to the Gospel of Luke. We considered, first of all, how important the Gospels are because um, they are a collection of eyewitness accounts of the life and ministry of our Lord. Um, it shows us, of course, in, in a most concentrated way how the Lord has fulfilled all of His promises in the Old Testament through the Lord Jesus Christ. It shows us, of course, who Jesus is and what He is like, the pattern that we are to follow. But most importantly, it shows us who our Savior is, the one we need to trust and to know that if we trust Him, we will, in fact, be saved. Now, we also saw how this gospel was written by Luke through careful research and the interviewing of eyewitnesses while all the time being superintended by the Holy Spirit. He's the author. And he wrote it to Theophilus. Remember, Theophilus means lover of God. We believe this man was a disciple um, and perhaps at the same time Luke's patron, uh, which is why the book may be dedicated to him. Luke needed a patron in order to have the book published. Now, we don't think, again, of publishing the books in those days, and they weren't published in exactly the way we would do it today. Can't use the printing press since it wouldn't be invented for another 15 centuries or so. But people knew how to write, and they could hand write them out. And uh, that appears to be the case here, so that there might be a broader distribution of this book. But he wrote it to Theophilus specifically that Theophilus might know the exact truth about the things he had been taught. And again, we saw the importance of knowing precisely what it is that the Lord has revealed. And then we saw Luke record the sending of Gabriel to break the 400 years of silence by announcing the coming of the one who would be the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who would prepare the way of the Lord by going out and preaching in the spirit and power of Elijah to bring the people of Israel to repentance and ready to receive their Lord. Again, if you don't know that you're in trouble, you're not going to see your need for someone to save you from that trouble. John the Baptist stirred them up with the, the law of God. And that's something that we understand that we also need to do if we're going to share the gospel with someone. They need to know why they need a Savior. And the way they see that is through the law of God. 
Now from here, we move to the second stage of fulfillment. The Messiah's forerunner is now here, not yet born, but still here in this world. And now it's time for the Messiah. Now we pick up the account in verse 26. Um, Luke tells us that we're now in the sixth month, the sixth month since Gabriel appeared to Zacharias, which means that John the Baptist was about six months older than our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's also quite possible that his ministry began about six months prior to Jesus coming uh, to begin his ministry. In other words, six months of preaching, six months of preparation. But now in this sixth month, Gabriel is again dispatched from heaven, this time to go to Nazareth in Galilee to speak to Mary, uh, whom we understand to be a godly young lady who was engaged to Joseph. Joseph, who was singled out as a descendant of David because this conception, this birth is going to be the fulfillment of God's promise to David that the Messiah would come through his line. Uh, one thing you may have noticed uh, in the Gospel of Matthew is that Matthew gives to us Joseph's genealogy uh, from essentially from um, Abraham, although he skips quickly from Abraham uh, to David and then works his way uh, to, the, to Joseph to show us that Joseph is in fact connected to the household of David. Now Luke does the same thing, only he traces it two things. He traces it all the way back to Adam, but he also seems to be tracing a different lineage than the one that Matthew gives us, which makes us believe that he was tracing not Joseph's lineage, but rather Mary's, to show that Mary too is connected to David. And I think that's important because Joseph is certainly Jesus' adoptive father, but Jesus isn't really related to Joseph, right? He is, though, related to Mary because he, as we saw in this uh, meditation, he was born of a woman, born from her substance. Uh, there are certain things that sort of stand out about the Gospel of Luke, certain things that are unique about this account that we don't see in the other accounts. And, and here's really one of them, and that is Luke's emphasis upon certain women that we don't see in the other Gospels. I mean, notice, first of all, how uh, Luke has singled out the appearance of Gabriel to these two different ladies. Uh, well, to Zacharias, but of course his involvement with Elizabeth, and then his appearance to Mary. These are things we don't read about in the other Gospels. One other thing that's going to be mentioned is Mary's trip to visit Elizabeth after this account here. It's the next thing that we see. And then, as I've already mentioned, Mary's connection to David. There's going to be many more examples like this, uh, again, which the other gospel writers completely omit. So as we go through this book, we'll notice him drawing attention to how women were so integral to our Lord's story and to his ministry. Now, secondly, we see when Gabriel arrives, he says to Mary in verse 28, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. Now, he said this uh, because the Lord, as with uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, had chosen her for a very important purpose. As we noted this morning, uh, if God is going to use someone uh, for his glory uh, in, in advancing his kingdom in, in a good sense, I mean, he uses everyone to do this, but if he's going to use someone for some special purpose in his kingdom, he usually, I'd say virtually always, uses clean vessels through which to carry out this work. We, I, I believe we see here that he had given Mary grace, and he had also given her the ability to make good use of that grace in order to grow into the kind of person that he would be pleased to carry and to care for his son. We need to remember that Jesus had to be raised like, like other children, right? He had to be taught. He had to be uh, led in the service of God and the worship of God. And so the Lord very carefully selects the parents that he wants to raise his son. And I think we see evidence of her character in her relational purity. You know, this young lady was engaged. She was still a virgin. 
something which today is virtually almost unheard of in, in our time, sadly, even within the church. Now, one thing I want to just draw our attention to is this, that uh, like Mary, God has also given to us grace. And like Mary, He wants us to use that grace as best we can to become as much like His Son as we possibly can. And also, like Mary, we need to realize that God has a particular purpose and a particular plan for us. Now, I, I think we understand and believe that really nobody else in the world could have been our Lord's mother. God had chosen and favored Mary, which is the reason why He brought all these things about. He had been working in her life from the time that she was born, even until then, to prepare her for this very thing. Now, she's unique in what the Lord chose her to do, but she's not unique in being chosen and having a specific purpose. The Lord also has a specific purpose for each one of us here who belong to Him, that He is working in us to fulfill. And I think one that we're not fully going to understand until we actually stand with Him in glory. But let me just say this, for that plan to be realized in our lives, we need to seek to use the grace that our Lord has given to us as best we possibly can to be clean vessels, holy and pure and ready for the Master's use. So that should be our goal. We have an example of that. In the case of Zacharias and Elizabeth, we have an example of that in Mary. Now, when Mary saw the angel and heard his greeting... Uh, it says she was very perplexed, which means she was deeply troubled. And when we see Gabriel's response to her, we also see that she was afraid. Now, not for the same reason that Zacharias might have been in the temple when the angel appeared to him. He was in a very precarious place where he may have been only once in his life in the temple of God burning incense. And if you are not prepared, the Lord might strike you down. You, you know, the, the uh, priests had to go through a, a lot of rituals, a lot of cleansing rituals and a lot of repentance before they would go into the presence of God. And maybe that angel was there not to bring good news. Maybe that angel was there uh, to bring retribution or, you know, to, to discipline him for not being prepared. But that wasn't the case, and it certainly wasn't the case here either. Mary was afraid because she was looking at one who was evidently not a human being, but an angelic being. And she was trying to understand what it was that Gabriel meant by what he had said. But seeing her fear... Like Zacharias, he immediately comforted her. Verse 30, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now, here's where I want to just draw a little bit of a contrast between you know, what things were like in the Old Covenant versus what they're like in the New Covenant. You know, it's not usually the Lord's intent to strike fear in the hearts of His children. When we are told to fear the Lord, what that means is not to be terrified of Him, so to speak, but rather to have sort of a healthy fear, a reverence of the Lord, not terror. Now, think about the many times in Scripture that Jesus did things that, that revealed who He was, that struck terror in the hearts of His disciples when they realized whose presence they were standing in and how Jesus responded to them. Um, when He came to His disciples on the water... And they thought they were seeing, in this case, a ghost. He said to them, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. When he revealed his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration and they heard the Father's voice speaking out of the cloud that had overshadowed him, they fell with their faces to the ground and they were terrified. But Jesus said to them, get up and do not be afraid. Now, as I mentioned before, in the Old Covenant, when the Lord gave the law, remember that He came down on Mount Sinai with fire and with smoke, and He spoke to the people with a voice that shook the ground and then it thundered. It struck fear in the hearts of the people because it was really a revelation of His just wrath against sin in order to strike terror into their hearts so that they would listen to Him, they would learn to fear Him and obey Him. But the New Covenant is contrasted from the Old Covenant by the author to the Hebrews that tells us that we haven't come to Mount Sinai, but in the Lord Jesus Christ, we've come to Mount Zion. 
Jesus has quenched those flames for us by taking God's wrath upon himself. And now he tells us not to be afraid. Now, what's more important here is what Gabriel actually has to say to Mary. You know, Mary has been singled out by the Lord for a specific purpose. First of all, to give birth to a son. He says in verse 31, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. Now, we'll come back to that in just a moment because Mary's going to ask the question, well, how can that happen, right? Uh, we'll come back in just a moment. But this son, notice, is given a name. She was to call him Jesus. Now, we saw this morning that when Gabriel came to Zacharias, he had a name for the son that he was giving to him, and that name was John. The name John means gracious, or in this case, a gracious gift given by God. And certainly, in Zacharias' case, they were old, advanced in years, beyond the age of childbearing. God graciously gives them a child, as he had uh, to Abraham and to, to Sarah. Now, in this case, he wants this child to be named Jesus. Now, Jesus, as I'm sure you know, is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Joshua. And Joshua is essentially, like many Hebrew names, a sentence in Hebrew. And it means that the Lord is salvation, an appropriate name for this one who's coming into the word. Joshua, Yahshua, Yah is a short name of Yahweh, the Lord, and Shua means salvation. We think about uh, what Gabriel said to Joseph when he told him what was going on so that he wouldn't think Mary had been unfaithful. He says in Matthew 1, verse 21, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. You see the connection between the name and what it is he came into the world to do. You will call him Jesus because he is the Lord who has come to save his people from their sins. Now, Gabriel goes on, perhaps she didn't fully understand what that meant, but he, he goes on to explain a little bit more. Uh, she's not only going to bear a, a son, but he, this son is going to be very special. He says in verse 32, he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Remember, Gabriel told Zacharias that John would be Great, And Jesus said of John, among those born of men, there is a, arisen none greater than John the Baptist except for one. And that is the one who is least in the kingdom. This one would be great, but he would be much greater than John. Think about what John the Baptist had to say about Jesus in John 1, verses 26 and 27. I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. How great is the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember how the disciples responded when Jesus put on the towel and knelt down and washed their feet. How uncomfortable it was for Peter. Lord, do you wash my feet? It's because they understood just exactly who Jesus is. He would be great. He would be the son of the most high, Gabriel says. Now, he's the Son of God in, in two different senses for two different reasons. He's eternally the Son of God, the one the Father has begotten from all eternity, the second person of the triune God. Uh, but he was about to become the Son of God in another sense when he becomes the Son of Man, conceived by God, the Holy Spirit, in the womb of the Virgin. The fact that the Holy Spirit was going to overshadow her and bring about this conception, he says, for that reason, this child shall be called the Son of God. And then he's also the one through whom the Father is going to fulfill his promise to David. We read in verses 32 and 33, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. This is the fulfillment of the promise that God made to David in 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13, where he says to him, When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, he wasn't talking here about Solomon. 
And he wasn't talking about all the kings that came after Solomon in his line, but he was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He would be the one who would build a house, not a physical temple, but rather a spiritual temple made of living stones that we might offer spiritual sacrifices to God. Now, as a side note here, I want you to notice it says, uh, the angel says to Mary that he's going to reign over the house of Jacob forever. This house of Jacob over which he would reign is not referring to natural Israel, not referring to the Jews. This is one of the things we need to understand about the new, the new covenant. And nor is it referring merely to the elect Jews that he had to gather out of Israel, but rather it's talking about all who are the true Jews, you know, all who have the faith of Abraham. It refers to us if we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about what Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians 3.9. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. And then in 4 verse 28, and you brethren like Isaac are children of promise. In other words, the true children of Abraham are those who have the faith of Abraham. Uh, the true house of Jacob are those who, like Jacob, are children of promise. It refers to those who really belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to reign over the house of Jacob forever. Jesus is reigning over us right now. Remember after he uh, died and was buried and he rose again and appeared for 40 days, he ascended into heaven to be seated at the right hand of the Father waiting from that time on until all of his enemies are subdued under his feet. It's during this time that he is reigning over the kingdom. All power and authority has been given to me, Jesus said, in heaven and on earth. And then he sends his church out to do his work. He's reigning now, which means that he is our Lord right now. Uh, he's the king, and he has the right to tell us what it is he wants to do, or what he wants us to do, and we need to listen to him. But notice, he will reign over us forever. Uh, he will be our king forever. Even when the consummation takes place, when our Lord Jesus Christ comes again, uh, his whole kingdom is going to be submitted to uh, the Father, essentially, or to the triune God. And Jesus, as the God-man, will continue to reign over his people who were given to him as a gift, the reward for his work, and he will have them forever to be his bride, and he will forever be our head. So he will reign over us forever, even in the new heavens and the new earth. But now getting back to that question, Mary said to the angel in verse 34, how can this be since I am a virgin? You know, how can she have a child if she and Joseph are only engaged and have not yet come together in marriage? Well, the angel answered and said to her, it's going to happen supernaturally. Verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Mary, you're going to have a child apart from a human father. Uh, a supernatural conception is going to take place. The Holy Spirit is going to bring about the conception. Of course, she wouldn't have understood this as we understand it today, but basically take one of her eggs and fertilize it and create a human being, one who would be perfect. And in so doing, he was going to fulfill, the Holy Spirit was, the prophecy that God had given to Adam and Eve so many years ago in his curse upon the serpent. Remember Genesis 3.15, where the Lord says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, speaking to the devil, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Remember that in Scripture, women are never really said, except for a couple of exceptions, and here's one of them, to possess a seed, just like a virgin can't give birth to a child, but yet here is a virgin who possesses a seed, one that is supernaturally conceived by the Holy Spirit. The Lord was speaking then of this event that Gabriel is speaking to Mary about. Mary would have a child without a husband, and this child would crush the serpent's head and in the process would bring us life. Now the one who was about to bring this about would be the Holy Spirit, who again, as I've said, would, would take of her substance so that Jesus would be one with us. I mean, the Holy Spirit did not create an entirely new race in the womb of the Virgin, 
But Jesus is connected with us. He is made of the same material, the same stuff we are. We're the ones who sinned. We're the ones who owe the debt. We're the ones who had to pay. And so Jesus becomes one with us in order to make that payment from our side. The Holy Spirit then again takes of the substance of Mary, creates a man who is without sin, who would be the head of a new humanity, whose personality would be that of the eternal Son of God. In theology, this is called the hypostatic union, which is essentially two completely different natures that are united together, not that these two natures come together and create something new. They're both whole, complete, and separate, but they are united by one person who possesses both. Jesus has a divine nature, and he has a human nature. What we're actually seeing here is what uh, the Apostle Paul speaks of in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7. The emptying of the Son of God to become one with us. He says in that passage, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God. Notice the word there, equality. Jesus equal with God. He did not regard that a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. This emptying does not mean that Jesus gave up any of his divinity, but rather that he took to himself something, taking the form of a bondservant, taking our humanity upon himself, becoming a man. So his emptying is an emptying essentially of reputation, an emptying of station, as he takes something infinitely below himself. The creator becomes one of his creatures, but he doesn't cease to be the creator. This is the descent of our Lord into this world that Paul speaks about in Ephesians 4, verses 9 through 10, where he writes this. Now this expression, he ascended. What does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. This is not taken to mean that Jesus descended into hell. We don't believe Jesus descended into hell. He went into the earth. He went into the tomb. He was buried, but he didn't go into the heart of the earth, to be tormented or to go down into the earth in order to free captive souls. Everyone who died from Adam and Eve forward, who believed uh, the Lord and trusted in the Messiah, went to heaven when they died. This is talking about our Lord's descent into the world in order to become one with us. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens. And this is what he was willing to do in order that he might save us. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now what the angel says next to Mary appears to be said in order to Strengthen, perhaps, again, faltering faith, only in this case she doesn't falter quite to the degree Zacharias does, to the point where she needs to be disciplined. She seems to be wondering, you know, um, how could this be? And the angel talks about what God has already done. Luke 1, verses 36 and 37. He says, and behold, even your relative Elizabeth, who's old and past the age of bearing children, has, has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who was called barren is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. So essentially he's saying, do you doubt what I say? Do you question? Is there any question in your mind? Your cousin Elizabeth, though she is advanced in years, has conceived a child, because with God, nothing is impossible. We do need to remember this next time we ask God for something. Uh, that doesn't require nearly as much faith as what Gabriel is asking Mary to believe. Um, God supernaturally created a child in her womb without a a husband, and Mary believes, okay? We need to believe that God is able to do 
whatever he promises. God spoke the universe into existence with a word. He is able to do whatever he wills. Nothing is impossible with God. We need to believe that. And then finally, we see Mary's faith and submission to God's plan. She understands. She says, verse 38, when Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. You know, she now knew that this was God's will. She believed that God could do it, and she submitted to his plan, and God's promise to send the Messiah was fulfilled. Our Lord descended into the world, and because he did, we are saved. Now, it is the heart of every true believer to submit to God's plan. Remember what Jesus told his disciples who were following him? If you want to come after me, you need to be willing to take up your cross and follow me. That's what he says we have to do if we are to follow him. We have to die to ourselves that we might live for him. And that's what we see Mary doing. I'm, I'm the bondservant of the Lord. Do to me whatever you will. Do to me according to your word. And that's what the Lord did. Well, that's the grace that God has also given to us by his Holy Spirit. We don't have to work up this Desire to do this, this is what the Spirit of God puts in our hearts, to serve the Lord in this way, regardless of what He might call us to do. And it's comforting, I think, to know that every time we do submit to the Lord's will, it always works out for our good, doesn't it? I mean, even if in submitting to His will, we lose our lives, it works out for good because we go to heaven. If submitting to His will, we, we are injured, well, Paul says... You know, said in Scripture that, that I glory in these brand marks of the Lord Jesus Christ that I've received this abuse which was meant for him. I mean, he took God's wrath for me. I'll take this abuse for him. It always works together for our good, and particularly here when Mary submits to this, brings the Messiah into the world. So it always works out for our good, and it always, of course, works out for God's glory which is exactly what our lives are to be all about. So now his mission being complete, Gabriel again departs for heaven. And he's dispatched from heaven, he goes back to heaven. He's going back to essentially where we're going to go because Jesus has come down to us. Jesus came down to us, he descended in order to lift us into heaven. We need to be thankful again that our Lord was willing to submit to his Father's will to come and to save us. And we need to be thankful that it was the Father's will that he sent his Son into the world in order that we might come uh, to know him. Well, may the Lord um, use this to encourage us and to build us up also in our faith and in our submission uh, to him. Well, let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer and, and let's, um, let's pray silently and ask the Lord uh, that he might do that.